Mary Isabel Catherine Bernadette O'Brien, OBE, known professionally as Dusty Springfield, was an English singer and record producer whose career spanned over five decades. Dusty was born April 16, 1939, in West Hampstead, London, United Kingdom. In 1958, Dusty joined her first professional group, the Lana Sisters, and two years later with her brother and a friend, Tom Springfield and Tim Field, formed the folk pop vocal trio called the Springfields. Their signature hit was called Silver Threads and Golden Needles, which came out in April of 1962. Their fame grew from the United Kingdom to the United States of America. Their band ended up breaking apart in 1963 because Dusty, Tim, and Tom all decided that it was better for the group to pursue their own careers. Meanwhile, Dusty Springfield was recording new albums and creating new songs for her solo career. In 1963, Dusty Springfield scored a massive hit with the song I Only Want to Be With You. It charted very high in the USA as well in the United Kingdom. This skyrocketed her career and fame. in 1963 she had many other hits such as You Don't Own Me and Wishing and Hoping. You don't own me I'm not just one of your many toys Wishing and hoping and thinking and praying planning and dreaming each night of his charm Later in 1966, Dusty scored another massive number one hit titled You Don't Have to Say You Love Me, as well as having another hit called Little by Little. <laughs> She also had many other hits, including All Cried Out, I Just Don't Know What to Do With Myself, Stay A While, Losing You, In The Middle Of Nowhere, and All I See Is You. Later on in her career, she sang a song from her album, Dusty in Memphis. This song was titled Son of a Preacher Man and was her biggest hit yet and was her signature song. <laughs> Life from there went downward for Dusty Springfield. She had very low self-esteem, saying that her chin and nose were very disproportionate and ugly. She became very discouraged and even depressed. All Dusty asked for was a big mirror so she could see and a hundred watt bulbs. I'm constantly peering in mirrors and people say, why God, isn't she conceited? And I'm actually not seeing anything. Many people at the time envied Dusty's beauty, 
but despite their encouragement, she didn't like her appearance. Due to her mother's death in 1974, Dusty became depressed, wrestling with her sexuality and increasingly dependent on drinking and drugs. She soon became addicted and described herself as a very obsessive person. She had many failed suicide attempts. I think in the persona that Dusty Springfield adopted in the, in the 1960s, you can see a conflict between the mask of the pretty, pleasant girl singer and then this tremendous other volcanic force, emotional force coming from beneath. Strange because you're hearing a kind of tragic muse coming from this 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 rather um, this typical British pop moppet. Sometimes people appreciate you, or me, or anyone in in this particular business, and uh, they like you for what you are and what you do and what you sing. And you might not think after a performance, say they come and say you were great, and I didn't think I was great, and it t took me several years to learn that it's very important what they think and not quite so important what I think. Because if it, if it makes them happy, that, that's what I'm in it for, to make them happy. We drank a lot, you know. The difference was that her drinking turned serious. She became very, very, very morose and very suicidal and she started slashing herself. Um, I, I once, she nearly killed me one time because she ran, she decided to kill herself in front of me. <laughs> and she ran at the wall and I, I jumped in between, because she was running with her head at the wall, you know, and, and I jumped in between the wall and her and she, I was, I, I was actually winded for a long time. She ran straight into me, she would have actually smashed her head. He likes to be accepted and wanted and loved and uh, Dusty was all of that, she wanted all those things. But she also wanted to be true to herself. So um, there is a lot of push and pull, and she had a lot of demons because of it. Uh, I think her sexuality was difficult because um, I think she knew she was gay by this time, and there is no way back in the 60s and 70s that you were going to talk about it. Do you want to talk? If you want to ruin your career, you can. It was a very despondent period in my life, and things were not easy at all. She was very, very lonely. She was totally on her own out there, and nobody came forward with the right work for Dusty. And I think she just got drawn in with hangers-on, quite honestly, that just wanted to use her for her name, but when she didn't do anything over there, by that time she'd got drawn into drink and drugs and was slipping down the ladder. So nobody was using her anyway. In Los Angeles, Dusty's sexual adventures took her into a violent gay marriage with a woman called Tedder. The wedding with Ted, it wasn't public. I mean, it was very much within her friends, people that knew her. Uh, God knows why. I mean, Ted is a loose cannon at the best of times, most unstable person, and another one, very, very similar to Dusty in a lot of ways, had been in and out of prison. Just bad news all round, but obviously there was something about the danger of it that attracted Dusty. It didn't last. She always said that when I, I brought England to her, that was one of the big things when I visited her. I don't think she ever got happy in America. Dusty's self-mutilation was like really horrifying. And I think, I mean, we talked about it after the relationship. Um, and she just said she was trying to see how far she could push me, you know? Um, but it was like really horrible trying to fight, you know, get the knife out of her hand. She knew she was in trouble with the drink and the drugs. And she decided that, okay, this was it, and she was gonna get over both things. And I, ha I have to say, my admiration for somebody that can get out of drink and drugs knows no bounds. And she did it. Can't see, understand your love. Finally, in 1988, she gave up her drugs and addiction.
But sadly, in 1995, she was diagnosed with breast cancer like her mother was before her, and she sadly died on March 2nd, 1999.